Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Matrix Mash. It's been a few weeks, but we are back. I'm Emily Moyer from Off Planet Radio and Robert Phoenix from 11th Health Astrology and Robert Phoenix, robertphoenix.com is here with me. And um, we have a lot of stuff to mash today, so we're going to hop right into it. Robert, it's good to be back with you. How are you doing? Well, I'm great, Emily. Uh, it's good to be back, too. And it's been a while since we uh, mixed things up a little bit here, but we got a lot to talk about today. Yeah, it's been a little summary, end of summary vacations and things. I, you know, I've had a little bit of switch in, in life lately, so it's been hard to kind of get back in the flow of things, but I'm ready to excuse my uh, visual here today. We're having remodeling done on the house, and this is the only spot in the house where you don't hear sawing going on. So Don't, don't head to the light. Remember that. Right. No, don't head to the light, right? Don't go towards the white light. You want the dazzling blue lights when you're in the bardo right. all right <laughs> all right so what's going on robert fill me in yeah so there's there's a lot happening um today of course is 9 11 oh yeah i forgot about that <laughs> yeah, it's, it's 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 a it's a palindrome of 9 11 because mm -hmm. today is uh nine one nine right and then mm. we have one nine so yeah pretty pretty interesting uh i'm sorry nine eleven so it's nine one 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 nine. nine. So yeah. we have nine eleven going both ways. It's a mirror of nine eleven. With that one in the middle that reflects back both ways. Right. So wow. so this really gets into like we're at a turning point. The Gemini magic of nine eleven. Yeah, uh, and, is, and yeah, this is a turning point. Which which, which perspective are you going to go? Which sort of you know? There's kind of two ways to look at this, and which way are you going to go? Which path will you take? It's a very interesting time. Uh, it is. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Did you see, uh, I was just um, watching uh, Ben Swan yesterday. He has a new podcast and he was talking, I didn't get to watch the whole thing, but apparently the fire department in New York has started a new suit, a new case. And they're saying, you know, they're basically saying that it is not the building seven did not come down the way, uh, the way that the report said it did. And we all know that, but it's interesting that now the fire department is, um, is, is going after that. Well, so. well they, so, so what's really interesting is if you go back probably about, about a month and a half ago, two months ago, um, the survivor benefits for 9-11 were kind of up in the air. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were actually, this is, this is a federal now. This is federal, not, not the uh, New York City or New York State. And they actually had a vote on it. One of the guys that voted against the survivor benefits of all people was Rand Paul, which I thought was kind of interesting. Huh. Um, so that was a big vote. You know, John Stewart came out and it's really interesting. He's been like this uh, real advocate for the families of 9-11 and their rights and their benefits and the first responders. It's, it's become almost like a personal mission for him in a lot of ways. I wonder if Rand Paul's, like, I don't know if he gave any explanation as to why he was voting against it. Um, I wonder if his opposition is just that simple thing of that government shouldn't pay for this kind of stuff. I think that's what it boils down to. Or if it's a, because uh, he's, we've heard him speak about this before on the Senate floor, or is this really more to do with connecting his opposition to the fact that the gov that our government funds the terrorist organizations that they say committed 9-11? And yeah, so I mean, if, there's a, if there's a deeper thread to it for him or if it's just about fiscal conservatives. I think, this, I think it's, you know, he's probably hitting a couple of, couple of mm -hmm. times simultaneously. Um, but the John Stewart thing is really interesting. It's almost like he's become this, um, r r you know, almost like a rabid, like a zealot uh, hmm. for the survivors' rights and specifically the first responders. So I had to ask myself, well, well, why is that? You know, why is he taking such an interest uh, in this? And I think it really boils down to, you know, the players of 9-11. Mm -hmm. And I think John Stewart knows who, who did 9-11. He knows that it wasn't, you know, just some guys with box cutters who took a couple of flying lessons and, you know, bugged out for, um, you know, beer in a titty bar, which is what happened down in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, Mohammed Ada and his crew, you know, they basically showed up a couple times just to make a, in a public appearance. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they, they partied, you know, this is what they did. So, you know, I think John Stewart knows who did 9-11. And I think he has a tremendous guilt complex. Mm -hmm. um, well, John Stewart is an interesting character. Finish what you're saying, and then I wanted to give you kind of my take on John Stewart. Yeah, so his brother, you know, was the head of the New York... Uh, 
head of NASDAQ. So he comes from a really, That's right. really super because powerful, talked about this before. Yeah. Super powerful family. And uh, of course he happens to be Jewish and um, you know, there are fingerprints of the Mossad and uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, what was it? The, uh, the, the, the B thing, gelatin, you know, you know, those guys in, in the building, you know, about yeah. Them? yeah. And then the movers. I mean, so their fingerprints are all over 9-11. The, dan the dancing Israelis, who Trump called the dancing Saudis, by the way. Of course. Which right. was interesting. I mean, I think the, I think the Israeli, so I think that 9-11 was a bunch of things happening at once. Like, I don't think, I think everybody's in their camp of it was just this or just that. And I think that the reason that this is, was such a successful disaster is because there's, there was different things happening at every level and everybody can only see the level that they're looking at, including the conspiracy theorists, right? It either was this Israel or was it inside job of the government or, you know, my, my feeling is that there was three things going on. There was elements of inside job of the government, there was elements of Israel, and there was ele elements of corp corporate, of a corporate kind of thing going on, right? And that they all were... You and I think some of the best, uh, the two best books, I think, I mean, obviously Judy Wood's information was interesting from a scientific standpoint with the idea of the possibility of directed energy weapons. I know that people, some people think it's thermite, some think it was nukes, some think it was directed energy weapons, and they're all insisting that it's only the one that they say. I think it's all three. I think there was some elements of all three going on because it leaves more things for everybody to argue and fight about, mm -hmm. right? So, and, and then that goes for the more, informational level of this too so the two books that i think are really well i think judy wood's book is interesting for people who don't understand anything about directed energy weapons and then the other books that are really good are uh, coup to 12 by david e martin and mm -hmm. he wrote it as a fiction but it's it's basically he did that to protect himself mm -hmm. uh it, i think it is exactly what happened in terms you know really close the closest thing to what happened and then joseph farrell's uh, book about 9 11 where he describes the three levels he describes those levels the inside you know, he describes the various that there was a Jude, there was a judy wood thing there was a you know like an israel thing there was an inside government thing there was a you know what I mean? Farrell actually talks about israel I, I yeah I th I can't remember if there was anything about Israel there, but I, I can't I, I read it so long ago. Um, but he. So I'm surprised. I'm surprised he didn't say that the Nazis were involved in. The well, he it, uh, there's he talked maybe he, he, he there is that too. There is there is there's always there has to be the Nazis because that's his narrative. So I think the Saudi you know. I think the Saudis were in on it as well. I think the Saudis were in on it. Israel was involved in it. I'm sure there was someone with Nazi background training technology science. I mean, it's so you know I think we looked at they threw absolutely everything at the wall. Right. They threw everything at the wall to leave all of us picking out, you know, the shape of pasta that we like. So I like spaghetti and you like Fusilli and whatever. They have the whole basket of pasta thrown at the wall and people are picking it out based on the inner narrative that they can accept and live with. Mm -hmm. um, I think David Martin gets the closest. Um, it, that book is two to 12. Uh, it had a different name originally and then it switched names. Um, but uh, John Stewart's an interesting character because I, I don't think he's. You know, so with some of these favorite, these famous people who get put in these positions, some of them are just wholly disgusting. And then others, like you see that there's, you know, grains of humanity in mm -hmm. them. And I think that like, he's probably been aware based on his family connections and stuff like that of what's going on in the world, but he's just not by nature a disgusting person. And so when he started doing his show the way he did it, it allowed him to do, speak little bits of truth, right? Little bits of truth that I think was enough to quell his consciousness. Right, uh, which is different than just lay, laying it all out there. But for him, there was obviously some level of guilt complex going on, and I think he chose to walk away from his show when he could no longer even do that without, with you know, it, 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 we started to watch an evolution where he was getting it was getting weird with him, and now they have Trevor Noah on his show. Who Trevor Noah is a complete and total bought and paid for asset of the libtard left, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, Stewart uh, for all of his. I think, you know, inherent flaws, which are, I think you can see, mm -hmm. was always very smart. I mean, he's really a very intelligent guy. Very smart. And he just doesn't make, he doesn't make me throw up in my mouth a little bit in quite the same way as a lot of the others do. Mm -hmm. right? he's, a, he's a Sagittarius, so he's guided by truth. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, the, the Sagittarian kind of impetus to, to clear the air and mm -hmm. get to truth would... I think, you know, have an impact um, on his life. He's born the same day as William Blake, who's, who's a total visionary. It's a fairly visionary day, close to the galactic center. 
So, you know, he's an, he's an interesting guy in that regard. Although I will say he shows up on LeBron James's show called the shop. Have you, have you seen episodes of that? Uh-uh. So he shows up on the shop a lot. And it's, it's basically kind of woke our us, you know, mm-hmm. mostly uh, young black athletes, uh, male, female, you know, who are kind of on sort of the left woke side. Mm-hmm. And, and um, Stewart has been on there a couple times. What's interesting is he comes in and he, he's almost like a handler in some ways. Mm-hmm. It's like he makes he sure, is a handler, yeah. He makes sure that the narrative continues to kind of go in a direction that I think he wants to steer them in. Well, the talk show hosts are always, I mean, Chelsea's named handler. She's a handler. Right. Ellen DeGeneres is a handler, um, you know, uh, you know and, and John Stewart on a certain level. I think that that's sort of what they're really good for. You know what I mean? Joe Rogan's a handler. He's also being handled. So I think these people have guests on, you know, to, you know, and there, some people don't even care about telling the truth at all. And others have that thing we're talking about. So they're like, okay, well, I can get let some truth out. We're not going to tell outright lies, but I'm going to guide the story in a certain way to protect the people who have threatened me or who are protecting me or who are paying me. Or- I got a timeout. Stop it. I got to take this. Okay. Pop, pop. Sorry about the interruption, guys. John Stewart heard we were talking about him and he called in to have a word with Robert. So what do you have to say? Uh, John Stewart said, Oy vey, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm an OG. So, yeah, so we went off on a side reel there. What is it, you were talking about his rabid obsession with f- fighting for the rights oh, of yeah, for the for the you know the first responders and 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 I and I think that somewhere inside of himself, I think he has taken this on as a personal crusade because ultimately I think he knows what happened, but I think he knows who participated in it. And I think this is a way for him to um, ease his conscience. Ease his conscience. That, that's my take. I yeah. could be totally wrong, but that's, that's, how, I, that's how I see I it. I mean, so there's that version of it, and then there's the version of it that some people would say, which I don't necessarily have an opinion on, uh, but gets some people all upset and worked out. There's some people that say that, you know, that is just to um, continue the narrative that this happened in the way that, that people say it happened, right? That, that, you know, that all these people died. And this, there are some people out there that feel that like 9-11 on a certain level was, uh, you know, um, hoaxed, right? Uh, you know, I've heard people talk about not, that there wasn't all these people that died. And I don't necessarily, I think in all these events, there are people that, I think there's elements with all of these events of false flag, elements of hoax, elements of, um, you know, uh, drills, all that kind of stuff. I mean, like, just like a, with whatever you think the weapon was that did this, I think they do, everything is going on at once. But there's some people at this point that are like, you know, they don't think anything is real, right? And so the argument would be made that Jon Stewart is insisting on all of this to continue the story that this was a tragedy that happened, that terrorists did to us and blah, 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 right? Um, so it is, you know, it, I, I suppose that depending on what position you want to look at it from, it accomplishes both tasks, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, he, he has a lot of fervor, you know, so yeah. he's, he's connected with it from this kind of deeply moral perspective. Yeah. And, and, um, and I, think I, I think I understand why. I could be completely mm-hmm. wrong, but that's my take. That's my, yeah. that's my take. Yeah. Any, any, anyway, so. All right, so 9-11. 9-11, today is the day. Now, this gets into the Bolton sack. I was, get into the Bolton sack. So last week, I was, talking about, I was talking about, in fact, I did the show with Regina, which will be up, I think, um, on Friday, okay. if I'm not mistaken. But we talked about uh, 9-11, and I said, you know, there's an astrological alignment where there's going to be something coming out around this, right around this time. And, and it may not be something that is, let's say, concrete, you know, like, like it, it, there's a, maybe it's oblique or symbolic or, or something along those lines. But um, it did happen because John Bolton was sacked the day before 9-11 and we're in this Neptune Sun opposition, Neptune, Neptune Mercury opposition. And John Bolton was on the, on the watch 
mm -hmm. uh, in the Bush administration during 9-11. I mean, he was part of that administration. So it's interesting that John Bolton would be sacked a day before 9-11. Like, like it's, it's almost, you know, kind of borderline QAnon symbolic. Yeah, oh, and then it also this thing came out with the fire department, right? So, and is there any connection between those things? I mean, John Bolton, first of all, whenever I look at John Bolton, Bolton I think back to uh, the Muppet Show when I was younger and what, he looks like somebody who would have had his own box on the Muppet Show. Yeah. Right? Remember, and they, each Muppet was in their own box. I mean, he just looks ridiculous. Um, but he's insane. I mean, he is, there, there is absolutely never any reason, there's no, no possible anything that anyone could ever say that would be a reason not to go to war. Every, there's a reason to go to war and to invade every country and to overthrow every dictator and to, you know, everything. Every, there's, it's never like, yeah, maybe we shouldn't do that. Ever, 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 ever. So well, for him, so, and to be clear, he's more than willing to go to war um, specifically to support our friends in the Middle East. I mean, he's right. deeply tied Israel, yeah. to Israel. Yeah. So, so this is a very interesting move on Trump's part. And the reason why, theoretically, he sacked him was because uh, Trump wanted to meet with the Taliban yeah, Camp David and Mike Pence and John Bolton got in the way mm -hmm. and they either shut it down or I don't know what they did, but they were going to make it very difficult for Trump to go ahead and do that. And once that happened, you know, say what you will about Trump, but if you get on his bad side, you're, you know, you're kind of fucked. Yeah, so with that kind of bring, well, let's finish the Bolton piece, but that brings us into an interesting thing about Mike Pence and an, and an idea I have and sort of some of what- I think he's was. gone, Mike Pence is gone. I think, so this, okay, I, 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 think, I think getting rid of Mike Pence would be the smartest thing for him to do. He um, has to, I mean, in order for him to get reelected, well, he's going to need to have somebody dynamic. Go ahead. This is what I'm thinking. So we're watching all this stuff go on with the DNC and Tulsi Gabbard, right? And obviously, like, whatever you're, whether you like her or not, she's bringing up, she, they, she embarrassed the shit out of Kamala Harris last time. I think they're afraid that she could do the same thing to someone like Elizabeth Warren. No doubt, they, they don't want her in the picture. They don't want her in the picture. And, um, I disagree with Tulsi on a lot of things, but I don't think she's mentally ill. And I, and, and I think she's wrong about some stuff. And I guess my biggest issue with her is that she still believes, like she, you know, I don't know if she believes that Al Qaeda and all this kind of, and ISIS are a real thing or that she understands that they're, they're funded by our government and they're a created element. And she's just not talking about that. I don't know. So that's my biggest bone to pick with her. Uh, she, I disagree with her about other things, but it's just because of my position of, as an anarchist. It isn't because I think she's uh, misinformed or lying or wrong, or, you know what I mean, or whatever. Yeah. I just disagree. Um, but she is not, she is, she's not mentally ill, and the rest of them are mentally ill. She doesn't have, you know, a parasite consuming her brain, making her do crazy shit like the others, you know, others are doing. And so, in my opinion, uh, people voting for Tulsi Gabbard or supporting Tulsi Gabbard is a sign that they're moving towards mental wellness as opposed to thinking that we need to support some of these other disgusting creatures. Um, so that, that said, like, I think, you know, truthfully, and this is, here's the deal. I actually think she's the only one with the, who could, could, if people woke up on the left, beat Trump. I think Trump is going to win, right? But if you wanted to have like a really interesting series of debates and some people who are Trump supporters start to question their position. Only she's, no, none of them, none of them like Elizabeth Warren or Joe Biden or Kamala Harris or any of that kind of stuff, right? She's the only one that could make it interesting. That said, I don't think they're going to allow it. And if they did, you know, I've also had questions about, well, is she like a safety valve? Like, are they making us think that they're against Tulsi Gabbard just so that they could trot her out at the last minute, you know, and, and just to keep us from people from completely losing faith in the system or something like that right there's a million things they can be doing with her her name tulsi means to cleanse tulsi is a t people take for cleansing no. so we're in a simulation that would make sense that her name is tulsi she's here to she's cleansing something she's shining light on something that has to, up till now not had appropriate light shown on it that said i don't think she's going to be the democratic nominee no, and I don't think that. I think the most interesting thing that could happen here that could overturn the whole thing and ensure a Trump victory uh, and really upset the system would be if he chose to make her his vice president, president his vice president, Rachel running mate. Well, they agree on a few things. Mm -hmm. yeah, they agree but... on a few things. And those people who are considering she, a lot of libertarians and a lot of never Trumpers like her, 
right? And there are some people, there's a good number of people on the left. So if there's any question about his electability, because the, some people might swing left, I think she would balance that. Mm -hmm. And I think that like, she's the kind of person, she's completely different than Mike Pence. She's charismatic. She is strong. She has military experience. So there, I thought about that would be, I, to me, that would probably be the most fun thing that could happen because it would so upset the apple cart in a lot of ways. Which, which Trump, which Trump, you know, he's not opposed to doing. Yeah. Right? The only, the only thing about Tulsi that I think might be prohibitive for him is his daughter. Mm -hmm. um, and she may get just insanely jealous yeah. um, at the prospect. But Trump is not above playing people against one another. In fact, that's what he does. So he might yeah. just do it just to see what his daughter does. I think Tulsi might actually be a better candidate for Secretary of Defense. To be well, honest. that's what I, my next thing was going to say. I was listening to Liberty Hound yesterday, and he talked about that since, you know, since jo John Bolton is going to be out as National Security, security Advisor, right? Or, right? He's National Security Advisor. So John Bolton. Uh, National Security Advisor, that's right. Yeah. So either as Secretary of Defense or National Security Advisor, she would be a very, very, very smart choice. And mm -hmm. if he did that before the election, that would also that would help him in the same way that a point asking her to be vice president would. So Absolutely. he needs if he's smart, if he's smart, he needs to let this stuff, you know, she needs to continue her campaign. Right. Mm -hmm. She needs to continue saying the things she's saying, gaining support. She needs to stay in the race for a really long time. And then when it starts to get close to election time and people's emotions are high, he needs to he needs to either appoint her to one of those positions or ask her, him to be her, ask her to be his running mate. I, I think probably a more likely scenario, um, even though she, you know, kind of dissed him, although Trump is on the one hand, he can be mercifully unforgiving. And on the other hand, if it suits his needs he can overlook a lot of things right and i also think i i actually think he probably has tremendous respect for her probably because she doesn't I, care what the other people think of her just like him yeah i i think that he probably might pull the the uh, nikki haley card mm -hmm. uh, because she's a woman and of course um she's adored by israel israel loves her um she's always the star of their apac meetings and she's a woman, and so, and she's, uh, she's, I don't like her. I think she's, I think she's detestable. Because Tulsi Gabbard or Nikki Haley? Nikki Haley. Oh, I was going to say, Tulsi Gabbard is like Tulsi. Back. Okay, Nikki yeah. Haley, I think, is detestable. Yeah. She's but, gross. But, she's revolting, yeah. But, but, you, but you, if you turn Nikki Haley loose in a debate on somebody, um, she would get her jaws into whoever she's debating with and would not let up. Yeah, like Tulsi. Yeah. She's got that kind of character. Yeah. Um, I also oh, it's interesting. They're both Indian. Nikki Haley and Tulsi Gabbard are both Indian. That's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I also think, and I know this sounds really, really far-fetched, but um, I've looked at their charts, and they are so hand-in-glove that this would be, if, if, if Pence gets booted, and I think he's getting booted, I think the dark horse candidate for, for Trump and the vice presidency is Tucker Carlson. Oh, that would be amazing. <laughs> Tucker Carlson. I love Tucker. <laughs> Tucker Carlson would ensure that whatever base that Trump has lost because he's fumbled the ball at the, at the goal border. line, i.e. At the border, border yeah. That, that people with Tucker Carlson in the fold would all of a sudden have renewed faith. And then, you know, whoever the debate team, whoever they go up against, well, Tucker Carlson would be pretty Well, fun. Tucker Carlson, so I love Tucker Carlson. And again, it's not because I agree with him. I, I agree with him on a few things. I mostly disagree with him because he believes in the system and I don't. Right. But I have massive respect for he, is, he will challenge, he, he, he will have people on he disagrees with. He will go against the, his own, what his own channel pushes on the other shows. He's not afraid to go walk into the murky territory and say what he thinks. I, I, I really respect him. I think that would be, he accomplishes a similar task as Tulsi. Right. Is that people who have, who have an issue, some issues with Trump with this person beside him would, it, it, you know, would accept, you know, would be willing to go along with it or would be willing to reinvest in, 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 in that proposition. Um, I had never considered the Tucker Carlson element, but Tucker Carlson does dress like a politician. So he's already halfway there. He's extremely smart. I do know that President Trump takes meetings with him on a regular basis. Um, he met with him in Japan. Yeah. And, he, and he said, hey, look, you know, here's my ideas. And, you know, let's be let's be clear. Uh, Fox is moving towards the left. 
because of Rupert Murdoch's kids. Um, Judge Janine has been suspended. Who knows when she's going to be? I mean, not that I watch Fox, but I know these things because I follow mm -hmm. things. I didn't know Judge Janine had been suspended. She's yeah, been suspended. I think Fox is moving towards more. Well, the other thing uh, with Tucker Carlson is you have people who are quote unquote center left libertarians who mm -hmm. are starting to rumble in the media, people like Tim Poole and Dave Rubin and whatnot, who would support a Tucker Carlson, uh, vice, would support Donald Trump if there was a Tucker Carlson vice presidency, not because they agree with, uh, with uh, Tucker Carlson, but he represents the idea of questioning authority, which is, they, they, which is the most important thing to them. Yeah, so um, we're looking at some really interesting changes <laughs> here in, in the uh, 202 yeah. universe. So. The Bolton thing is, is a really big deal because he's a dyed-in-the-wool neocon. He's connected mm -hmm. to the old guard, yep. Wolfowitz, Richard Pearl, um, Lewis Scooter Libby. Um, yep. You know who they are, Bill Crystal. And, and I, was, I was talking about this on my show today, that the neocons are, are ba basically rebranded Trotskyites. Totally. And they, they, they came over from Russia with Leon Trotsky and settled in Mexico because mm -hmm. they were, you know, they were on the lam and Trotsky was going to try to go back in and, and take Russia back over from Lenin. And Lenin wasn't, he wasn't going to. And then he realized that. I can just take America over instead. So, so what the Trotsky eggs did is once Trotsky got, got an ice pick to the back of his head, they left Mexico and they relocated to the United States and they eventually became the neoconservatives. Mm-hmm by William Crystal's father, Irving Crystal, um, and uh, what's his name? Um, was it Ezra Cohen? Uh, anyway, the, 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 the neocons have been a big part of the kind of the, the warlike, not even warlike, they're just war hawks. And they've, yeah. dom they've dominated nearly every single um, administration with totally. the exception of the Obama administration. The but there was even a lot of them in there. Think about like Samantha Power and all, you know, she's the one who was doing the shit in Libya and the Ukraine and the, the, what, the other one, the Newland doing the crap in the Ukraine. Well, New Newland was a holdover from Bush. Yeah. She was a holdover. So, so she's I, definitely a neocon. Then she left once. They're all, they're all now what I would consider to be this, uh, hybrid of a neocon and neoliberal which is no, neocon, no. neocon on foreign policy and neoliberal on domestic and social policy yeah yeah they're so all was, the same thing yeah totally um well bolton now is is kicked to the curb and his his buddies won't like it they will not like it they're going to be pissed at trump and and um it'll be interesting to see what happens you know if and if they go after him if they go after him, what way will they go after him? How will they go after him? Um, it's kind of a big deal. And the other thing, too, is that th there's a very precarious balance now between Trump and Netanyahu mm -hmm. and Bolton. Um, this, is, this, is, this is a really interesting monkey wrench. And again, it's an echo, excuse me, it's an echo of 9-11 because of Bolton's involvement. The other thing that happened is that um, the guy who was the ambassador – uh, to Israel, mm -hmm. uh, he stepped down. So he's gone, and, and um, it, it doesn't get any, any better than this. this. This guy, Avi Berkowitz, who's 30 years old and is Jared Kushner's buddy, and basically he, he's, he was like the coffee boy in the White House. Um, he's now the new envoy to Israel. And, <laughs> Avi Berkowitz. Avi, Avi Berkowitz. Avi. <laughs> He's 30 years old, and he's been tasked to carry out this um, Middle East peace program. And it's like, wow. I mean, it's incredible. And I thought, it, this is either just complete idiocy or it's genius. Yeah. By putting an inept 30-year-old in that position to accomplish something, probably doesn't happen. So the, the, whole, the whole world is just kind of in this spin right now. Yeah. And um, it's really – you know, on, on one level, it's kind of fascinating to watch. Yeah. yeah, it is. Everything is extremely unstable now, and there's tremendous opportunity in that, and also tremendous possibility of what the fuck. Yeah, yeah. you know. We've got, so. we got a grand mutable cross going on. Um, yeah. So actually, it's a T. It's a T square right now. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, a, it's 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 there's a lot happening. It's very it's very very unstable.
All right. So let's uh, let's move on to the next thing, which was I think the force. I think you would wanted to talk about fashion and uh, veganism and cannibalism and some stuff like that. Yeah. You know. Um, let me see if I can find this thing. Can you can you make me uh, a host so I can? Yeah, I can make you a host. Screen share. For sure. Let's see. Whoop, you are co-host now. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me just throw this up here. Now, you have to understand that YouTube is operating on algorithms. And these algorithms theoretically look at what you watch, what you like, and then they deliver content specifically geared for you. Or, or that's a, theoretically, but what they're really doing is deciding which opinions you hold need to be manipulated and then sending subtle, gentle put presses in another direction that you won't recognize as that. Now, you know me pretty well. You know what I like. Mm -hmm. We talk about mostly what I like and what you like on this show, a lot of crossover. Um, do you see anything in here that I would find remotely interesting? So this was recommended to me, okay? We got uh, GG Gorgeous, Drag Transformation, Violet Tchotchke, Spend the Day with Me in Paris with Dior. Uh, I got invited to uh, Naomi Campbell's airport routine, Come Fly With Me, the Dolan Twins, here we go, Gemini again, uh, at Louis Vuitton, then Spring uh, Summer, and then welcome to your front row seat to fashion. Like, so the, the, I, you know, I, I've been getting, uh, it looks like there's, a, there's now a fashion section on that, that, that didn't used to exist. So I think they may be pushing the new section that used to just be like entertainment, news, education, music, blah, blah, blah. There's now a, a fashion section apparently because it looks like that's what's happening there. But I've been getting a lot of that kind of stuff too. So uh, I don't know if, um, if we're getting that because both you and I use the term transgender a lot. And I think what we're starting to see in fashion is uh, uh, where you really can't tell who is who. I'm also getting a lot of this AS commercials for ASMR, which you and I were going to talk about on the show once, but we never did. Right. So we may want to revisit. I had an interesting question about that from someone the other day. Um, I get these uh, commercial videos suggested it's a commercial. It looks like an ad. The other one was like an iguana eating a kiwi as ASMR, like, you know, weird noises and things like that. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know if everybody is getting that. They're just trying to influence everybody. So it isn't necessarily directed at you or I, or if they're picking up on the fact that we've, you know, I feel like this ASMR thing somehow is connected to the gender thing. Like I do, because it like, it, it, when I look at the uh, tone, like of, of that, and just the whole, like the first time you and I ever talked about, uh, my body is like, just got the chill come over it right now. But like the first time you ever explained to me what it was, you were talking about like long fingernails tapping, right? And I watched a video and it was like, it looked like a drag queen's long fingernails tapping, right? Yeah. So I yeah. think that like this ASMR getting people into this trance state. So the other day somebody sent me a, question uh someone that i you know asking if there's what's up with the something like is uh, it was a weird question about gum chewing is there is it like is there like a gum chewing mind control thing or some weird kind of right and it, because somebody had noticed that all the female professional golf players are now chewing gum which is something that they had never noticed before so i looked into gum chewing and golf and it turned out that that there's some people who are using gum chewing as a form of ASMR. So it isn't like the gum chewing. Yeah, I used to think that, oh, chewing gum helped me focus, but it wasn't about the sound of it. These people are saying the sound, the snapping or whatever is a form of ASMR. So it's being pushed in every avenue right now, right? So this, yeah. what is this trance like? Think about how many suggestions you get on YouTube also for things like um, solfagio rhythm, uh, uh, solfagio, uh, binaural beats, like uh, meditative music, ASMR, all of this kind of stuff, you know, like it's, um, we, it, we deal with frequencies that are trans inducing anyway. So, um, and there does seem to be some weird, I, I don't know what it is, but it does all those, look at a lot of those ASMR videos have that 
tone that like have like a drag queen tone to them or like a you know something weird there's always something that looks like it has like bright colors or too much makeup on or something in the asmr videos right it's never just somebody sitting there with their plain normal looking finger like you or i tapping on something it's always some weird element to it right I, so asmr was coined by jennifer allen and she's not a scientist, but she was looking to create an official kind of sounding name for this uh, sensory phenomena, which is things like the fingernail tapping, um, you know, kind of clicking a comb, scalp massages, whispering, anything that kind of sends a tingle down the back mm -hmm. of your, your neck and your spine. Uh, is Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. Yeah. That's what it stands for. In some but of these I, ASMR videos, I get a camera. I get a com I get ads for ASMR videos every day on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Every yeah. day. I've never. I've only ever looked up the video once. I talked about it in text messages on my phone once. Yeah, some, some, of these, some of these videos get millions and millions of views. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's incredible. Like literally, people are watching iguanas eat kiwis. Right. And being fascinated by it, and are they going out and like buying kiwis and iguanas and doing either you know, like what is happening here? Well, I, I think in a lot of ways it's kind of this strange antidote for being sensory overloaded, mm -hmm. because everything about the internet that, that we've experienced is fast, 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 fast for speed, fast for downloads, right? You get back to me fast if you're not you know clicking on my you know, uh, you know liking my Facebook post within a relative amount of time. You know, I, I get anxious, you know, so it's all about fat. I need to see it, I need to see it. But they can't, it. they can't tell people just to close your computer and go outside and go for a walk because they still want people engaged and they still want to be controlling their minds. So instead of having them watch something that makes them anxious, have them watch something that makes them feel relaxed, but they're still doing it online and you can still manipulate how it affects their mind. Well, so I think a lot of the ASMR, I could be wrong here, but I think a lot of the people that get into ASMR do it when they go to bed. And they want to feel relaxed. They want things to like relax them. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if there's an actual visual component to some of this. I mean, maybe the, the Kiwi thing does have that visual component, but you're right. It is a simulacra of, you know, the analog world. And like why, why not to relax, go outside and go for a walk? Why not have your significant other massage your scalp? Why, or, you know what I mean? don't have, they don't have significant others. Or, well, that's part of the problem here, too. YouTube has become everybody's significant other. Yeah, that's true. So the I mean, ASMR I was in a hardcore, fully committed relationship with YouTube for a really long time. Like I would watch YouTube videos 16, 18 hours a day at one point. Mm, so I understand that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think there was a time when people, you and I have talked about this, you, you get on the kind of the, the YouTube Express and you just jump from one car to the other and, mm -hmm. you know, five, I mean, that's the way the internet used to be. Now I fucking can't stand YouTube. I, okay, I, less, so, I watch less than an hour a day of YouTube now, whereas I used to watch all that other stuff. So they're promoting this fashion thing in a big way. Mm -hmm. that's, that's like, it's, 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 you know, it's always been around, but it's, they're kind of, they're trying to grab the youth to get them to think about fashion as being as being cool, fashion as being like a, a career choice, um, fashion as a way of you know self-expression. Of course, you know in that place the gender lines blur, and, it, and, and it, where it's headed kind of reminds me a little of um, uh, which we call it. Um, oh my God, I'm having a, a blank moment now. Um, Hunger Games. It's kind of reminded me of the yeah. fashions, the fashions yeah. of the Hunger Games. Remember there was fashion shows going on in Hunger Games. That's, That's right. That's Lenny right. Kravitz was a fashion guy. That's right. And so basically what they're doing is they're kind of following up on this and they're creating the, the, the pocket, you know, the so-called so civilized and aesthetic pocket for the dystopic future. Well, even if you look at like uh, in the movies, besides Hunger Games, all of them, the TV shows, whatever, when they're in these dystopic places, the controllers are in really elegant high fashion, and the those being controlled are in what we would look call like so military or, or military high fashion, or mm -hmm. um, uh, sort of um, mm -mm. yeah, like teen, like Mad Max high fashion or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. The other thing that's going on with fashion right now. Um, like 
the first of all, they're, they're focusing on fashion, but some of these fashions that they're pushing on everybody are insane. Have you noticed that like now the, the highest fashion that they're pushing for women is basically mom jeans and orthopedic shoes? Like, yeah. Like, I'm just like, what the fuck is this, dude? It's like, we're, they're, they're, they're punking people. They're like, we're going to put up forward the most ridiculous thing and see if we can get you to spend millions of dollars on it. Yeah. Like, I, we, were, we walked by like a, um, a Prada store the other day in Phoenix at the, at the you know, fashion square kind of thing. And literally there's like these Prada shoes that they look like the orthopedic shoes my grandmother used to wear after she had her knee surgery. Right. Right. And people are paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars for things that look like orthopedic shoes. Women are wearing jeans with the, the waistband up, up underneath their breasts. Yeah. It's yeah. You see, you, see that, you see that on TV. It's being, um, it's being shown on commercials. So, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, they, they're basically creating this kind of very weird, um, surreal, um, it's 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 almost like they want to craft a world that is so unrecognizable and doesn't have any touch points to the 20th century, uh, you know, uh, the dominant culture, whatever those things are. There is a revolution going on in the fashion world, and they're trying to. And I think this is part of this kind of, you know, revolutionary vanguard, and and that it's it's not that far. Um, it's like, it's like, I think if you kind of worked on it, you could make a bridge between Antifa and fashion. Totally. You, you know, and, and Bowie was really prescient about this. And he did a song called Fashion from um, right around, what was it, uh, uh, 19, scary, the Scary Monsters record right around what, 1979, 1980. And, and his whole thing with fashion is fashion, turn to the left, fashion, turn to the right. You know, we are the goose squad and we're coming to town, beep, beep. And so he's making this connection between fashion and fascism. Totally. Well, think about, I mean, Hitler had Hugo Boss design the uniforms. I mean, Bowie loved those Nazi uniforms. He always, yeah. Michael Jackson loved uniforms like that, too. Like a lot of the, you know, like Freddie Mercury wore some stuff that looked like that sometimes. You know, um, I, I, I put Freddie Mercury into a different kind of class than I would put Bowie and, and uh, Michael Jackson into. I, but... Um, uh, it, it's always been a thing in the Janet Jackson wore some of that looking stuff. Madonna, Absolutely. think of Madonna in the, uh, express yourself time where she was wearing all that stuff. It was from a clockwork orange. Yep. Yeah. Right. Or from metamorphosis or something like that. But it was always like these very like militaristic looking things that were also, you know, like, yeah. Wow. So it is, I agree with you. I think it's, um, I don't know. I just like to, I just wear my jeans and my tank top. Dude. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to do everything in their power to, you know, have this breakaway civilization inside the culture. And a lot of people think that the breakaway civilization is um, one of Elon Musk's or, or um, Jeff Cap. Bezos's rockets, right? Now there's a break, they're trying to create a breakaway civilization. Within the civilization. Within the civilization. And yeah. fashion, fashion is the front line and the vanguard. And what they want to do is they basically want people uh, with their, and the hairstyles are, that go along with the fashion um, are, they're, they're bizarre. I mean, they're, insane. they're really bizarre. So, so they're, they're, they're forwarding the bizarre hairstyle, the bizarre attire, so that there's no reference point. So people who were kind of part of an older generation or part of a different paradigm. Don't know who's a man, don't know who's a woman, don't understand what's going on, don't understand if these people are human or if they're aliens from another dimension. Right, and so yeah. what happens is they feel, they feel alienated. Yep. Like what's going on, right? And meanwhile, this kind of, you know, cool new kids club, they're the in crowd. Yeah. And YouTube is celebrating them. Commercials are celebrating them. Um, you know, this is, this is kind of, kind of the new thing. Yeah. So it's, it's all about being an esthete, but it's, it's a, you know, and I, I know a kid here in, in Fredericksburg. He's a really great kid, very smart kid. Um, he's, a, he's a Libra. So he's drawn to music and he's mm -hmm. drawn to fashion. So he, you know, he's totally into Travis Scott and he started to make his own t-shirts and do his own stuff. And now he wants to go to Poland and study fashion in Europe. 
And look, I think, you know, good for him. You know, he's doing something that he likes. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bang on him for that. But it's just really interesting that, that we're kind of getting up to this point of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We're kind of getting up to the top of the pyramid, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, fashion is nowhere near the bottom. Yeah. You know, it's kind of up in this place, well, uh, this is an abstract need. Yeah. And we're, we're kind of up there. When you get to the top of the pyramid, you know, it gets a little wobbly. Yeah. It gets yeah. a little unstable. So it's, it's, it's so they're, what they're doing is they're basically. It's part of the destabilization campaign. Part of the destabilization. It's part of the demoralization and destabilization that uh, Yuri Bezmenov talked about. Well, absolutely. It's a, it's, it's a revolutionary act. You know, yeah. one of the things that I, I, you and I talked about this, and I, I wanted to bring this up before, and it's another kind of fashion um, oriented um, sort of meme. Right, and and it, it was the uh, the TV series Space 1999, um, okay. and and it was uh, a series that was about uh, the moon having this nuclear explosion, and it gets like thrown out into the uh, into the into into space, right? Okay. And and one of the guys that was uh, involved in sort of creating the design and the outfits is this guy Rudy Gernreich. And um, he was uh, Rudy Gernreich. So he did the costumes for, for Moon City and 24 episodes, 75 to 76. So he's the guy that kind of, kind of plants uh, the flag there. Now, if you, let me see if I can find an image for Space 90, 1999 because it's worth looking at. And it gives you an idea as to how these things are planted in our consciousness years in advance uh, with generally a, 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 a kind, of, kind of a plan in place, right? There, there's, there's a, here, this is a really, really good picture here. Let me bring this up. And this is a Rudy uh, uh, Gernreich um, sort of at his finest. So let me, let me throw this up here. And you'll see what I'm talking about. So here we go. This is this mm. is how the future was imagined. Yep. And really, what they're so why does the future look like the '70s? Well, what they're peddling is unisex. Yeah. Like everything. Like the women don't wear skirts; they wear these tunics. Well, um, I guess the '70s, '60s, and '70s are like when the women first started wearing pants and jeans, and and there was started to become a, it started to become closer the fashion between men and women. We go we go out and everything we see, both fashion wise for the home and for clothing, all looks like it's from the '70s. Well, so there's there are a few exceptions to that. Like if you look at the women on Star Trek, they're dressed like Playboy bunnies. They um, all wear short, short mini skirts. I haven't seen that. Yeah, and, and then Logan's Run, which is kind of a famous 70s film, science mm -hmm. fiction film. You know, all the girls are running around with really short, skimpy uh, shirts, plunging V-lines, so, you know, so. I guess there's Fifth Element, too, with Mila Jovovich and that kind of. Gerard Wright yeah. was doing this for a reason, because okay. he was trying to create a style that was unisexual. Okay. And Gerard Wright was, um, he was, he was a very weird guy because he also created um, a bikini that was basically uh, the, the, the monokini. The monokini. So he has this, yes, we've talked about yeah. He has this weird extreme. He's yeah. The monokini, which is objectifying women and letting their you know boobies hang out in space, and then this weird kind of you know almost like socialist unisex thing. Garen, Garen Reich was was gay. Um, that's, that's number one. Number two, he was lovers with a guy by the name of Harry Hay. And Harry Hay was probably um, one of the most radical uh, uh, sort of gay, uh, proto-magical activist. He was basically a gay warlock. That's what Harry Hay uh. was. So he was a thelemite, um, and he was also um, the guy who um, established NAMBLA. Yeah, okay. so he was he was he was a key player in Nambla. Um, he he was a thelemite. He also was very subversive, and his, one of his lovers was Will Gear, who was uh, Grandpa Walton. 
on the Walton family. Mm -hmm. So, so Garen Reich was, and a lot, and a lot of men looked towards this Harry Hay guy because he was out on the front lines of creating not just kind of this, hey, we're passive and we're gay, but we're gay, we're radical, we're revolutionary, and we're gonna we're gonna be subversive. So part of I think what Garen Reich was doing was being very very subversive and saying, okay we're not going to recognize any differences between the sexes. Everybody's going to just be one. And this is ultimately how fashion works. Well, do you also remember, and I think the next chapter in that book may have been, do you remember when Calvin Klein started that perfume called One? And that was about the same time that Kate Moss became their major, their major model. And she was first on those One commercials wearing the men's underwear. So you had both Kate Moss and Marky Mark wearing those same underwear. Right. And in that commercial for the unisex perfume, that was one. Right. So that was that was the signal that we're in the future we're going to return to this androgynous state. But it's not going to be the natural, high spiritual androgynous state that we may have come from. It's going to be this controlled, manipulated exterior androgyny. Right. Right. So if you go, you know, if you, if you look at the um, the picture again, Space 1999. It is kind of androgynous and unisex, but if you look, you know, Barbara Bain, you can kind of tell she's a woman, right? You can see her, right. her boobies, you know, she's, she's got a nice little bob and everything. But, you know, so there is some degree of, um, uh, of separation in some ways. Now the new version is wild. It is, you know, it's, it's over the top. It's uh, transsexual. You don't know who's who, right? So instead of like, sort of making everything brown and gray, you know, sort of the old kind of, you know, socialist Soviet sort of model. Now yeah. it's like, let's explode everything and make it very, very difficult for people to identify who's who, what's what. Yeah. And it's going to be the same effect, you know. And, yeah. Yeah. It's also part of controlling people's ability to say what they mean because they don't know what they're looking at. So Right, like, uh, better not say anything because I'm not sure what's, what's going on here. Right, so yeah. again, then we get into the politically correct, yeah. uh, you know, noose around our necks, so. Yeah, mm -hmm. boy, all right, we have a few minutes left before our heart out. Did you wanna get into some of this? I, it might be a longer conversation about this same thing being pushed on us with diet, with veganism and cannibalism and all this kind of stuff. You want to start that or you want to save that for next time? Or I have some interesting things to say about that. You know, what do you, what do you think? You want to start? Yeah, or you want means, to... I mean, you've, uh, you've opened the can. I've left the kit. Okay. So the, yeah, like you, you had emailed to me, texted to me that you wanted to talk about that. I don't know what angle you're looking at it from, but I certainly have noticed this. I saw an article this week about uh, cannibalism being a, a possible solution to climate change. And of course, at first I was as repulsed about this as anyone else would be, but then I thought, well, maybe it is a solution. If all the people who believe in climate change eat each other, we won't have to deal with that bullshit anymore. Right. right. How about that? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> you know, there's, it's, a, it's an interesting... <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting small leap from cure to cure. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. So that, that could be the case, you know. Well, let them, let them eat. Well, I think eat. it's interesting that there push, there's two th there's only two things being offered as solutions to climate change or whatever, and that's veganism or cannibalism. Right. Right. So the third, the third is bugs. You know. Bugs. Right. Bugs. bugs. Right. But well, the bugs veganism and cannibalism, and um, yeah, and there's this weird kind of bridge now between veganism and cannibalism. I know a lot of people who are vegans who are not opposed to the idea of cannibalism. That is just so twisted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there, there's a restaurant here in los angeles called cannibal club that has this very cryptic is that, weird yeah, is, website is that, is, that, is that real because i talked about that with uh, on one of my shows it's i i don't know if it's real or not but they if it's not it's certainly that they want people to believe it's real i do believe that there's a lot of both vampirism and cannibalism going on here in los angeles yeah. um they wanted to start to introduce the idea okay so there's that tv show called the santa clarita diet Right. which uh, my cousin writes for that show. Um, but I think whenever, uh, whenever something like that is introduced, it's like it, they didn't, you know, there was a, a big campaign the first season for the show, but it's not like a majorly popular show, but it still sits there off to the side as a possible idea, 
right? Just like they, ha it's the same as the politics. They have Tulsi Gabbard and Andrew Yang sitting off to the side as a possible idea with their, what they consider wacky stuff, right? So you put something out there just to start the UBI thing, right? Like start, ha start that conversation because they may want to go there in the future. They may decide to push that hard in the future. Take people's temperature on it. Introduce a show with Drew Barrymore, you know, about this, you know, suburban housewife who starts becoming a cannibal, right? See what people think. Can we push this or not? So let's introduce that at the same time as this bleeding impossible burger. What are people going to go th go for? You know what I mean? They're, the UN wants to put the UN pushes veganism. I've talked a lot about this with Michael Joseph. Um, you know, they push veganism, but you know, not everyone's going to buy veganism. But there's some people who who may buy, go for cannibal. I mean, this whole thing is just in, in, insane to me um, that this is where we're at. But um, I do think that there's a strain of people that exist in this reality that have no qualms about, they don't think, they're, they're completely immoral on every, on every front, right? And, uh, and also who on a certain level seem to hate humanity because the idea of eating each other is a better idea than eating animals to them. You know what I mean? Like, I don't love, I mean, I eat meat. I was a vegetarian for 15 years and a vegan for a year. Sure. Like if we lived in a perfect world, would I prefer to not have to harm, you know, harm beings, but we're in spiritual warfare. I don't feel good when I eat a vegan or a vegetarian diet. Uh, the world would be horrendously, uh, w w the world that we'd be in a huge environmental crisis is all, all of a sudden everybody start, started being a vegan or a vegetarian. Like in, if they didn't fish the sea for one year, we'd be in an environmental crisis. Because that's at this point we've evolved to fish the sea. Maybe if we'd never started doing that, it would be fine. But at this point, if we, you know, if everybody went vegan, we'd be in a lot of trouble in a year. Yeah, yeah, to totally. Have you seen these videos where uh, the vegans have been busted uh, when they've been eat caught eating meat in public? Have yeah. you seen these? <laughs> no, I would love to see that. So, so some of these YouTube uh, vegan stars who've made a lot of money um, with their their shows and scooping out avocados and juicing and you know all the stuff that goes along with that um and sell you know doing webinars and retreats a lot of them have been slightly going back to meat on the side mm -hmm. they, have, they haven't told their audiences i think it's totally fine as long as you tell the audience like you I know like it's, i haven't. mean i you know that the, the, that's part of the reason i've always been pretty clear with even though like i you know I, I, I know what I know about diet and sugar. I like to have a cocktail sometimes. I eat pizza sometimes, not, you know, and, and sometimes I, it's really easy for to be, me to be strict on diet. Sometimes it's harder. You know what I mean? Like, do I aspire to eat as little sugar as possible? Yes. Do I know that's probably the best thing for me? Yes. Do I also know that we're here having a human experience and one of the few pleasures of being human is things that taste yummy. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. I think all of this stuff, it's great to share your knowledge and your discoveries, but, um, yeah, like, you know, if you're, if you're saying you're a vegan for health reasons, then there's no problem with saying occasionally my body feels like it needs meat and I, and I give it to, to my body. If you're saying you're a vegan for moral reasons, you know, then I guess that's, you know, maybe that might be a harder thing. But still, if any, any normal human being is interested in their own survival and well-being, so I don't like eating meat, but occasionally I feel I need to. There's nothing wrong with that. And I don't, but it goes against a brand and people are really c concerned with branding and pushing a narrative and sticking to that narrative. And, you know, I don't know, it's retarded. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, I mean, the other thing too about- Every vegan I've ever known loves bacon. So they would love human, which is supposedly <laughs> a lot like bacon, also known as long pork. The other thing about, about cannibalism is it fits into this kind of dystopic model of um, like, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, The Road. Have you ever seen that movie? Mm -mm. By the way, I highly recommend uh, seeing The Road at least once. It's a hard film to watch. Can, um, we, can we pop in and start with cannibalism next time? Because I, I have a hard out and just, I have to be somewhere at 1045. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? So, yeah. So just, just watch The Road and, yeah, and, um, it's it's the you know long pork is a staple of a post-apocalyptic. Yeah, we can pick up with this because I do have more things to say about it, and I'm sure you do. And I want to talk about these impossible burgers and some of this vegan stuff that's being pushed and and, and why it's so dangerous. All mm -hmm. right, sorry we have to cut it short a little bit today, Robert. I always love doing this. You, it's good to be back in the saddle. Let's uh, let's get get to it a little more frequently in the uh, coming weeks and months. Yeah, and if if you don't know, Emily is going to be here in Texas. 
uh, with me and we've got an event happening here in uh, Hill Country. And it's gonna be uh, Emily, myself, uh, Glenn Streeter, who's got a bunch of magical healing devices and uh, the Krimis are gonna be there. Um, they're gonna be great. Um, and uh, uh, Joan Sefcik, who's a, a biological dentist. This is gonna be kind of a health emphasis for yeah. this gathering, which is gonna be really, really good because you need tools to live for. I I'm very excited. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be there talking about esoteric nutrition, sugar as programmable matter. Yes. I'll also be available for uh, nutritional consultations or life coaching sessions uh, during some of the free hours of the conference. And so hit me up on Facebook if you're interested in that. Yeah, and, and I still, I've, got some, I've got some spots available still. Um, it's gonna be the weekend of the 11th, 12th, and 13th. Uh, here in Texas, and there's a lot of other really cool things. My good friend Stephen Kent, mm -hmm. Didgeridoo, world, world class Didgeridoo player, is going to going to have a he's going to do a concert for us. Yeah, and uh, we're going to have um, you know local cuisine, which happens to be kind of meaty, so barbecue, a little Tex Mex, some other stuff involved. With some options for people to donate it. Anyway, it's going to be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It's a good way for you know you to meet people like Emily and myself and the crimmies and um and, and the difference between this and a lot of other of these bigger conferences is that we're there to deliver information so but we're also wanting to hang out with you guys so we're not going to be secreted in our room with our security guards <laughs> uh, you know it, it, right we're going to be there hanging out interacting having a good time with all of you so it's we'll going to be very experiential we're going to yeah. hit enchanted rock uh chris is going to teach us how to douse out there uh this uh, woman adrienne uh, who's a yoga instructor is going to bring her mats. We're going to do yoga out by Enchanted Rock. It's going to be cool. Cool. So anyway, come to my website. Maybe and we'll post a link in here if you're. We'll post a link. I'll post a link. I'll post a link. Yeah. All right. We are out. We will see you guys next time. Thanks, Emily. Toodaloo. All righty.